Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar from the Atchison Group, an exploration of a pizza's life in which, in which our tag supply chain experts will be discussing the food safety roles of each step of the complex journey of food safe fixins from consumer to grower. I am Lisa Lupo, TAG's Director of Communications, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Our supply chain expert presenters today are TAG Food Safety Director, Mary Hoffman. With more than 20 years in the food industry, Mary has held technical and managerial positions at a variety of food production companies, directing corporate and facility level quality, R&D and laboratory teams, and maintaining complete oversight of food safety management systems. Mary has extensive experience leading proactive initiatives to assure the safe manufacture of food, including that of supply chain risk mitigation. Our other presenter is TAG Executive Senior Director of Food Safety and Supply Chain Risk Management, Liliana Casawardo. In her more than 25 years in the industry, Liliana has held technical and global leadership roles managing supply chain food safety and product quality at the corporate level. She has provided guidance and direction to facilities around the world, ranging from company facilities to their suppliers, distributors, and external partners. Liliana will begin our presentation with discussion of the consumer's role and expectations. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. We're really excited to be here today. Same here. Happy to have you. And uh, we're going to be together enjoying our pizza from when you buy it to how it became a pizza. And hope that makes you buy lots more pizzas <laughs> after this. <laughs> And really, before we jump into our content, we want to first hear a little bit from all of you. And we're going to make this a little bit interactive. So we're going to invite you to join by going to a web browser on your smartphone or opening a new tab on your browser and typing in www.menti.com. Once you do that, it'll ask you for a code and the code is at the top of my screen. It is 46947829. So the first question we're going to ask you is just in general, what do you think about when you think about pizza or when you're going to buy a pizza? We're asking everybody to share a couple of words. Um, also, I want to add, if you don't have access to a smartphone or you don't want to participate in the Menti exercises, that's fine too. We're just going to do a few here and there to try to keep it interactive. But don't worry, if you don't um, participate, it's not going to take away from the presentation. So we'll give you a couple of minutes. Just tell us what you think of when you think of pizza. I like that comfort food. Yes. <laughs> and the cheese. I like the cheese. <laughs> cheese is definitely a comfort food. Some people like deep dish. I like that mm. cracker thin crust. Yes, nice and crunchy. If you are logged into um, Menti, it'll be easy enough. Then we do future exercises. The new question will come up. So you shouldn't have to log back in every time we, we do one of these. Mm -hmm. But thank you to those of you who participated. Um, we feel a lot of the same things about pizza. Um, and interesting to note that nobody said anything here about a stomach ache or getting sick or anything like that. Um, we all just expect 
when we order a food a pizza or we buy one from the grocery store to make at home, we all just assume that that pizza will be safe. And we're we're not trying to pick on pizza here either. It just is a good um, example product to use so we can talk through the complexities of food safety and the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So to get started, you all shared your your expectations for the pizzas, which are the same as mine, my husband, uh, my friends, your friends, everybody, when you buy a pizza, it's because uh, your pizza is is something delicious. It's an indulgence. It must taste good. Uh, you're expecting it to be a pleasure, to look appealing, to taste delicious. Of course, you're hungry when you eat it. And sometimes we eat more than what we need for when we're hungry because it is so delicious. So when you really like a pizza, you it stays in your memory and you could almost taste it sometimes if it's that good. So you want to taste it again. But of course, it is without saying that nobody's thinking it's not going to be safe. It must be safe. So the journey today is going to be, uh, it's designed to show you what does it take to make that pizza safe? Something that as a consumer, we take for granted it is a real, very good expectation. But it's a journey that needs to be walked to make sure that that pizza is safe. So next. <clears throat> I think we wanted to quick ask one more Menti question here at the start. Yes. So before we dive in too deep, we want you to think about food safety and pizza. And you should have a multiple choice question now on Menti. If you haven't logged in yet, again, the information's at the top of my screen, menti.com, and there's the code. But what are your thoughts? Who's responsible? for the food safety of that pizza that you bought, that you plan to buy, whether it's from the grocery store or from a pizzeria. That's great. That's great. Great. Thanks for sharing. Um, and and yes, everybody uh, from the ingredient supplier, distribution, the retailer, the pizza manufacturer, and the consumer, depending on the type of pizza that you're buying, is going to be responsible for the safety of that pizza. We can go back to the slides. So uh, usually, I mean, uh, for the team that is here, I am assuming that there is some, uh, there is expertise on, on food safety. So people that work on food safety, uh, people that work on food always have that expectation. And we all go to the store with uh, a more in-depth expectation. And uh, we're looking into how they handle food safety on, on every area of the store, fortunately or unfortunately for us. Uh, but usually the consumer, uh, as I said, takes it for granted. So if you look at the complexity of the supply chain, uh, it goes to different process, starting from the farm and going through uh, a manufacturing process, going to wholesalers, uh, dr the distribution logistics process that gets it to the retailer and then to the consumer. But the eyes of the consumer usually, the first thing that comes to their mind when people have a complaint about their pizza, it's going to be going to that retailer from where they bought the pizza, even if it is uh, a pizza shop, a chain of pizza shops, or a supermarket uh, where you bought your pizza, it's going to go, it's going to be going there and saying, okay, I have a problem with my pizza. Okay. So if we can go to the next one. So the consumers have the same expectations for their pizza. Doesn't matter who makes their pizza. So uh, if it is made by by your local pizza shop, or if it's bought at the supermarket, or if you buy it at a at a food service chain, you still have the same expectation, which was what you shared at the beginning, and which was part of the slide that we shared. You want to enjoy it. 
It's going to be delicious. And you're not going to be thinking that it's not safe. If it fails you, that's going to be a problem. We can go to the next one. So the consumer behaviors and how the consumers un, uh, manage their expectations, how they go to get their pizzas, uh, follow different different areas of communication. Social media is a very big one. We all know that. And, and we're more and more involved on social media. Uh, mainstream news are also part for many for many uh, consumers, also part of how they get their information and build their expectations. Uh, always word of mouth, talk to friends, family, neighbors, uh, people when you travel and, and, and they tell you good things about things about certain stores, brands, your own perceptions and assumptions. When you buy a pizza, when you consume a pizza, what did you think about that pizza? So independently of what everybody says, your own perceptions and, and assumptions are very, very important because it's going to drive your decision. And of course, the history and support for the brands, okay? Uh, loyalty of the consumers is, is big. Consumers are not forgiving. So if they have negative perceptions because the pizza shop or the, the pizza brand have failed to them, they're going to remember that and they're probably not going to consume it again or they're going to be very reluctant to consume it. So that's why uh, for companies or for pizza shops or for pizza chains, it is very important to invest every time they make a pizza in driving the positive perceptions of the consumers by giving them the best in every sense from, from the organoleptic uh, perceptions to the food safety. We can go to the next. So for the for those who make the pizza, does it matter if you are uh, a big manufacturer or a big pizza chain or a local pizza store? Uh, the goals are the same. You're going to attract and, and retain the consumers uh, because you want to make eating of that pizza a unique experience. Uh, so the responsibilities are the same. And the severity of food safety failure will have disastrous consequences for both. What they what will be different probably is the outreach of the consequences versus a small store and a local uh, uh, national chain where the pizzas are distributed everywhere, and the impact is going to be a lot broader. But at the end of the day, for those that make the pizza, the impact for them is going to have tremendous impact which will impact their business based uh, related to the size of the business, but it will impact it. We can and something else I think of, Liliana, when we're talking about the responsibilities towards the consumer, uh, that frozen pizza that's coming from a grocery store, um, some of that additional responsibility is communicating those responsibilities that the consumer is taking on when they purchase that pizza to make it at home. So if mm -hmm. this is, you know, keep this frozen until you cook it or cook it to a certain temperature, whatever the case may be, there's another mm -hmm. difference in the, the way those responsibilities are communicated and transferred from one party to another. Yeah, great, great point, because uh, the responsibility of the consumer has to be highlighted on how they're going to handle, handle it. And the directions to handle it have to be described on the package. You cannot uh, think that the consumer is going to understand how you handle it without a description on how they have to handle it. At the end of the day, even on the frozen pizza, you owe the consumer directions on how to handle it, and the consumer has to follow that. And even on the on the pizzas that you have to warm, uh, you you're going to have the same the same responsibilities. Okay. Thank you, Mary. So what are the regulatory requirements? If you, look, if you look at the process of a pizza, doesn't matter the size of the business, doesn't matter if it's manufacturing a thousand pizzas per hour or uh, 30 pizzas per hour, uh, it follows the same model of having a suppliers of ingredients and packaging, an operation where the pizza is, is made and cooked or uh, packed if it's frozen and uncooked, and uh, it's gonna get to the consumer. 
the responsibilities, the regulatory requirements for that is that it complies with the FISMA, with FISMA and the food code and state regulations. Uh, that the suppliers are required to meet the same regulations, and if they are uh, foreign suppliers, they need to meet with a foreign supplier. They need to comply with the foreign supplier verification program. Uh, if they're using fresh produce on their pizza, they're required to meet the produce safety rule. Uh, because there is transportation involved, uh, the steps that require transportation are required to meet the sanitary transportation rule for distribution and uh, the traceability rule, which is going to be uh, implemented in January, uh, they will have to comply with the traceability rule. So FISMA uh, established guidelines uh, to uh, Com ensure regulatory compliance and consumer safety. Uh, it established the approach of a preventive control criteria to manage the risks of the supply chain based on the high severity and probability. And, and the supply chain controls must effectively mitigate the biological, physical, and chemical risks, uh, must assess the risk of food fraud if it impacts food safety, and uh, for that, you rely on the effectiveness of th these controls based on the strength of your supplier approval program, how you monitor those existing suppliers, and how you handle emergency sourcing for when you have an issue with an approved supplier. Great. Before we jump into the next slide, we want to hear from you again. So switching topics a little bit. Focusing on, you know, Liliana talked about getting the food from the manufacturer, the ingredients from the suppliers, um, that very important step of distribution. And we wanna hear from you, what do you think is the distributor's role in food safety? What things do they need to do to make sure that all of this happens in a safe manner? So again, um, the web address is menti.com. And the code is at the top of my screen, 46947829. And you should be able to see a text box. And you can just type in whatever your thoughts are on how distributors are required to keep food safe. Temperature controls, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely temperature controls. What else? Pest control, clean interior. Absolutely. Keep the truck locked. Excellent. Good storage conditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So we, we are walking the pizza backwards because we want to know the the steps that the pizza took. So when the pizza uh, was ready to go to the retail stores, it went through a process of warehousing uh, and transportation. And you all have said it, you need to have good pest control management at the warehouse so that there's no risk of uh, insect or rodent infestation, that there, the, the, that there is no access for insects or rodents that can contaminate uh, the pizzas. The same with transportation, that uh, the, the, the vehicles are handled uh, in a way that you're guaranteeing that you're not transporting pests together with food, uh, that there's a good temperature and humidity control if the product requires. In this case, the pizza is going to require it, so uh, there's going to be good temperature control that the cleaning and sanitation practices are in place so that the place is maintained clean and uh, the product is maintained clean. Uh, that the infrastructure, there is integrity on the infrastructure both for the warehouse and for the vehicle that does the transportation so there are no water leaks, uh, no accumulation of, of dirty water close to the product, uh, that the products are packed, uh, that the products are well packed, so there's no exposed product or risk of exposed product that can be contaminated in, in during during the warehouses or transportation. 
if there is packaging material that is held on that warehouse for the pizzas, that those are maintained adequately wrapped also so that they don't get dirty, they don't get exposed to the elements, that there's no risk of uh, water leakages, roof leakages that could get them wet. And that you have a food defense program that protects the product from uh, maybe intentional alteration, use of chemicals to contaminate packaging material or product, or, uh, or, or risks that could pose an unknown risk for the consumer. Uh, yeah. I, I like, yes, go ahead, Mary. I was gonna say some of our participants answered, you know, that they need to keep the truck locked. And that comes yes. back to that food defense piece. and. I know something that we talk with some of our clients about is, you know, what's the best way to do that in different situations? So ideally, you know, you've got that truck seal and you're matching the seal numbers and you're breaking that seal. That's not always possible, right? Maybe you're using less than truck loads. So talking through how can you manage that? Is there a padlock that only certain people will have the key to that padlock, for example? So you know, it sounds very straightforward. We know that in practice, these things can be a bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. And just remember that those seals, okay, they have numbers and they need to be part of the bill of lading. I mean, I, I, I have visited warehouses that I have seen and they, oh, the truck driver comes, the seal broke. Can you give me another one? And, and you know, some people at the warehouse hand them a seal. So how do you trace that seal to look that the integrity of that truck was maintained because nobody had access to it? If they change it and it's not on the on the documentation with the bill of lading, then you can't guarantee that. So do you have the right programs in place or do you have the verification that whoever does that for the warehousing and the transportation for that pizza have the right documentation in place to track and trace it and consider that a nonconformity, okay? And do people understand why they're doing it? Right? So much of this comes back around to training. And I know this isn't a training webinar, but so much of it comes back to, to, your, to your staff, to the people responsible for this, understand why they're doing what they're doing. So an example like Liliana gave, they would understand that that wouldn't be acceptable to just, oh yeah, let's just put a new break out a new seal and we're good to go. Mm -hmm. And for every, uh, I mean, and now we get very passionate, but for every step of food safety, okay, you can consider training in two ways. Training is telling people what they have to do. Education is telling people why they have to do it, why it is important. So if you educate, you tell them why, they become part of the solution because they understand the role. And we're going to talk more about this, but they understand the role, they understand their responsibility, and they want to be part of the success. Okay. We can go to the next one. So if we go backwards, uh, the manufacturing process, we talked about different pizzas. And if we are going to classify the processes, if you look on, on your screen, you have three big steps, which is the suppliers of ingredients and packaging, the making of the pizzas, and the taking the pizzas to the consumers. If we are making the pizzas, we have uh, processes that are transformational uh, to create part of the ingredients of that pizza and other processes that are not tr non-transformational. In the transformational processes, you are using ingredients to turn them into something else, okay? Something that is different than what those ingredients were. And when you talk about transformational processes, you talk about more complexity, more things to look into. So my challenge to you after this webinar is for you to go to the store and maybe instead of an hour of supermarket tape three and look at how many how many products that you're going to buy there went through transformational processes okay and some of that some of that the the ingredient statement is going to be very telling because when it tells you the number of ingredients they are they have it's going to tell you that it went through a transformational process versus you look at uh, toppings like tomato, like basil. Our pizza is tomato and basil. We like we like that pizza. <laughs> but uh, 
So those ingredients were non-transformational because we had to get tomatoes ready to be put on the pizza. We had to get basil ready to be put on the pizza, but we did not have to change what they were, okay? We had to handle it. So we can go to the next one. So if we look at how FISMA expects us to handle and control food safety risks in those transformational, for all processes, but especially those transformational processes have complexity and uh, there's going to be a necessity to have a comprehensive preventive approach to control food safety risks. It doesn't mean that the non-transformation are not going to require attention to be safe. Uh, the processes are going to be simpler, still a preventive approach to handle food safety, even for the tomato and for the basil, although they look as simple as they are, okay? So the when you look at preventive controls, you're looking at uh, processes that apply to a family of product or a specific one, and you design that to control the risks for that product or for that line that makes the, pro the similar products. And you have, you build a hazard analysis, uh, you're going to have your recall plan ready, and you're going to have your process controls, which are part of your HACCP plan, and then the preventive controls for sanitation, allergens, and supply chain controls, okay? And each of those are going to have to, uh, when you do your hazard analysis, you are going to decide which ones are going to be elevated to, uh, to be preventive controls, or which ones you're going to handle as GMPs, which you have on the other side, which apply to all the products manufactured at the site, okay? If you look at the GMPs, you're going to have practices that are done on the whole site, and that site could be making pizzas and calzones and, uh, uh, I don't know, different things, tortillas, different things on different lines, okay? But they're still going to have to have uh, full programs to handle the prerequisites and risks at the site that could impact food safety, such as employee health, having in, uh, integrity in the infrastructure, guaranteeing that you have no openings, uh, that you're not going to have any risk of roof leaks or uh, risk of cracks and crevices where you could have buildup, that there's a preventive maintenance program in place that looks at infrastructure, but also looks at the good functioning of equipment, uh, that you have sanitary facilities and good controls to manage that, look at sanitary equipment design and manage the utensils appropriately, that you have, if, you ha you're, if you're handling raw ingredients and then in that facility you have a kill step, uh, you have a segregation for the raw materials so that you don't carry the risk of uh, biological uh, risks to the the treated side okay that you have a process for your manufacturing operations uh and that includes the handling of allergens in that how you're going to manage your allergens so that not do not to create allergen cross contact risks uh and the distribution part and in the allergen part i i want to stop a minute to remind that fda has expectations uh has if you have allergens, the minimum expectations are that you label those allergens so that the consumer is aware that there are allergens and that you handle those allergens in a way that you are preventive from contamination. Even if you have a precautionary statement, that does not open the door to carry the allergens. You still have to clean, you still have to validate those cleaning procedures to make sure that they are effective to get rid of the allergens, okay? We can go to the next one. So when we talk about supply chain controls, supply chain controls are those that if you look at, uh, at the process flow, the supply chain flow, uh, it's going to happen for those in for those uh, ingredients that are coming to the facility to put together your pizza, okay? And it could be happening also to facilities that are putting together part of the transformational components that we talk about to make that pizza. It depends on the complexity of the process that you have, okay? But 
when when is it that you require a supply chain control program when the suppliers are controlling the hazard in your hazard analysis you are buying an ingredient and you're saying okay if this ingredient needed a kill step my supplier is handling that then you need to have a supplier control program to make sure that you have uh, a program in place to verify that that is being done and effectively uh, monitor and and uh, review the performance of that supplier and how they're handling that we're going to talk more about that okay if you need to have a supplier control program you need to have approved suppliers and that's where you define what is it that you're going to be looking at from those suppliers and how how often you're going to be looking at that what kind of verifications you're going to be requiring from them to make sure that they're not only they're saying what they're going to do, but they're doing what they say they're going to do, okay? Uh, and then if you have to allow emergency sourcing at your facility, make sure that you build a policy that explains to all your cross-functional teams, your procurement team, your uh, R&D and product development team, uh, that what is going to be necessary for emergency sourcing be prepared for that because that happens and usually when that happens the procurement manager calls and says oh my god i have to stop 10 lines or i have to stop sending uh, raw pizzas to the franchises because they can't cook so we have to bring flour from ting back to and uh I've got a shipment that is coming on the way and is arriving to port tomorrow and we've got to bring it to the plant. And a lot of people are going to push you to say yes, okay? So think of no first and think of uh, a yes maybe and think of having in place everything that you're going to require to do, what kind of verifications, what kind of sampling and testing, what kind of data you're going to request from them, what kind of history you're going to request from them, what kind of verifications of uh, no recent recalls? If you build all that and make sure you build it looking at your supplier approval program and looking at all the things that you can ask in advance. And if you have a container on the way, papers can be sent on email faster than what the container arrives to port. So you can get a lot of information ahead of time to make that emergency sourcing easier, including latest GFSI audit, including uh, testing that they've done, including internal audits that that facility has had, okay? So make sure you have all that ready and have your cross-functional teams trained on that so that they know, and even you can give them a checklist. You need emergency sourcing. At the same time you're looking at buying it, request all this so that then we can work together and make this happen. The success of the team has to do with how you communicate, how early you communicate, and how you succeed in having an effective program in place. If you don't have those, you're still responsible for the food safety of that product, and you're still responsible to guarantee the safety of the consumers. FDA doesn't care if you had to do emergency sourcing or not. The expectation is you're always delivering safe product to the consumer. The last thing I would like to say here is that a supplier control program is not required if you're going to handle the hazard yourself. So if you're getting all the ingredients just raw and, and you, the only hazard that you identify is a biological hazard and you have identified that they have no uh, physical or chemical risks, it's not the usual, but you could have get to that point then you do not need to have a supplier control program, okay? The other situation is if you're making an intermediate product and that biological risk is going to be handled by your customer. So you're going to sell it to them and tell them, you know, I did not handle my biological hazard because you are the one that's cooking, okay? Let's go to the next one. Yeah, I just want to quick stress before we move on, right? Liliana just described the requirements for the preventive controls for human food rule, we of course recommend or suggest that you do have a supplier approval program, even if you're not technically required to, um, according to that regulation or whatever regulation applies to you. Um, we just really recommend as a best practice that you have some level of minimum requirements that are, you know, that makes sense for what you're sourcing 
um, to have that in place. Um, so you really have a good idea of what risks you are managing with inside your facility. Mm -hmm. And that is very important because not having a, a, a supplier control program, what, what Mary said is you don't have it as a preventive control in your food safety plan because you determined that you didn't need it. You still need to know about how your supplier handles all the hazards, even if you're handling them at your facility, to make sure that if there is an incident, you know how to manage it and what could be the root cause, okay? The more you know ahead, the better. So great point, Mary. <laughs> So if we if we look at all the challenges and how the, the supply chain has evolved, okay, uh, the complexity has uh, increased because the supply chain participants are not, not are no longer limited to the first tier supplier. And the first tier supplier is the supplier that supplies you. There's a complex network of sourcing that is broader uh than the first year between the supplier the manufacturer and the distributors everybody is involved uh from growing for harvesting processing packaging transporting holding and selling of the product and anybody can be both the grower and the packer or the processing and the packer or can do the transportation themselves they can be holding the product so it is complex and you have to build that in your supplier sourcing model for each ingredient, okay? Uh, some participants of, of this supply chain model can have multiple roles. Uh, usually, it's very common now that the sourcing is done globally. So there is there are foreign suppliers, even for smaller uh, smaller pizza makers, for example, there's still some involvement of global suppliers that, that they use, maybe the spices, maybe. So nobody is just working on domestic suppliers, and you have to think of that when you build your model of supply chain. Uh, communication is faster, but there are language barriers, a complex network, multiple channels of communication. Uh, people use different carriers. Uh, the regulatory environment is a different one. When you work with global suppliers, the regulations are not exactly the same. The burden of the regulations for each of the risks is, is different. Uh, I have worked with countries that uh, regulatory-wise, they do not require allergen labeling, for example, or other countries that have different standards to, for example, test for coliforms and E. coli. Uh, so you have to look at that environment and make sure that your goal is when you're bringing a product to use for manufacturing in the U.S., they have to be compliant with U.S. regulations, and that's part of the foreign supply verification program. So that's where communication also comes in to share requirements with those. People outside the U.S. don't need to fully understand the regulatory environment here. They usually don't. So it's up to the buyer and up to the company and up to the food safety and quality team of that company to build communication for them to understand, okay? Uh, natural disasters are front and center. Uh, today we're talking about a hurricane in, in Florida. So natural disasters are unexpected. Uh, a week ago, this was just a, maybe a hint. Oh, where does it go? We don't know. And uh, today, Florida is... is being hammered by a hurricane with all the risks that that brings for the people uh, and the food and and everything there and that happens in other parts of the world and sometimes we're not even aware of it okay if there's an earthquake in indonesia yes it comes to the news but it's not front and center but an earthquake is going to have severe impact for growers in that area for example and uh, or, or a drought or so Natural disasters become a relevant factor and should be part of questionnaires when you're looking for approval of new suppliers, okay? We can go to the next. So what are the challenges? And, and we've been hearing about supply chain now for months. Uh, the pandemic has, has, has left really a huge impact on supply chain all over the world. 
a lot of countries more impacted uh, than the US. So you have to think about that model and think of it globally. The, the workforce is a challenge everywhere. There's big turnover, there are less resources. Some people have changed their habits. Some people have decided they're not working anymore or they want to look for other, other working opportunities in other areas. So it has really been reshaped. There are a lot of political and financial threats. The, the pandemic really left big sequels and some countries that are big growers because of the climate. I, I, worked, I worked a lot with, with Coco throughout the years. Uh, working for the Hershey company and and cocoa is a challenge because a lot of the of the growers are really in in countries where resources are difficult with a big political challenge where financial uh, threats are hard and that impacts growing areas uh, management of the crops so you got to look and understand those the cost of manufacturing are higher uh, Transportation is a big one these days, okay? I mean, uh, many of the clients that we would we talk to or even going to conferences, we find that finding carriers is a challenge for many different companies and product categories, not only uh, globally. Globally, we've heard about the lines of containers waiting to get to the ports uh, regionally as well. Then also, there's not enough truck drivers and even local transportation, okay? We talked about climate change, keep that front and center. It's, it's, it's really important. It's affecting uh, ingredients in many ways uh, and changes in demand and availability. Consumer habits have changed. Availability of products have changed. We can, we can go to that. Sorry about way. that, Liliana. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So uh, we talked a little bit about the risks of the supply chain. Um, we talk about risks that the ingredients in here and carry because of the areas where they're grown, geographical risks because of uh, the composition of the land, uh, uh, the, the risk of allergens at the grower level because there's crossover of crops uh, that could leave traces of allergens uh, on, on, the, on the dirt. Uh, Climate changes and big droughts that flood areas and carry contaminants that were not usually present for those crops. Uh, agricultural water is a big one, and FDA has even regulated on it uh, because agricultural water could have hidden risks that maybe not be considered in your hazard analysis. And then, surprise, surprise, you have a biological contamination that. Uh, is impacting your product. And if you think, for example, think of Florida today, okay? Florida is getting flooded, part with ocean water and part with rainwater, and that water is going through dirty streets and where there's insects, there's rodents. So one of the risks that comes to my mind is leptospirosis. It, it's a risk that is, is there. Usually you're not walking on, on flooded, dirty water, but if you do, or if you're washing food with not clean water, or if your water got contaminated on the source and you have that disease, you're gonna get impacted and have severe impact to, to the consumers. And there are others, okay? The use of pesticides, regulations are different in different countries. So pesticides uh, are a matter of concern. Some pesticides that are approved in other countries are not approved there and uh, regulatory requirements have to be met. And we have seen a few import alerts and import detentions because of use of non-authorized pesticides that are authorized in other countries. So make sure you build your program and you work with your suppliers to be compliant with the regulations of the country where the product is gonna be sold. So if it's gonna be consumed here, work with them to understand. Uh, heavy metals, uh, Cadmium and arsenic are usually uh, heavy metals that are going to be present because of the type of composition uh, that the, the, the dirt has, the land has in the areas where they are grown. So that it's something that you have to look at and handle based on mixes of uh, the commodities to make sure that you control that and you don't, you're not at levels that can impact the health of the consumer. Uh, 
and then radiological risk as well that are also part of the risks depending on the zones where the commodities are grown, okay? And then you have supplier risks, which come with uh, from, from the farmer to uh, the brokers, to the wholesalers, how it is managed and, and the risk of foreign material. Uh, sometimes when the commodities are bagged, uh, there's risk of, of foreign material that can be even intentional, sometimes to gain weight on the bags, sometimes unintentionally because they're, they're handling a lot of product and there's pieces of branches, stones that go in there. Uh, allergen management is another one, understanding the allergens that each ingredient can carry and make sure that you segregate those and, and don't reuse bags so that you cross-contaminate other ingredients. Again, pesticides and heavy metal risks. Lead is one that could be uh, at the supplier level because of uh, inadequate design of equipment or inadequate cleaning and destoning of, of products, okay? Mycotoxins are others that can, be, even though it's an inherent risk of ingredients, for example, for peanuts, it's it's well known and there's maps of how, how uh, aflatoxins are gonna be higher or lower because it has to do with the moisture and it has to do with how much it rained. You can handle those on, the, on how you manage your crops at your warehouse to make sure that you're not introducing that to the consumer. So it is an expectation. Suppliers know that when they handle the ingredients, they know it and they can handle it. So. On, on purpose, I put it on the supplier risk because they are aware and they can manage even their buying practices to make sure that what they carry as a total in their warehouse is going to be manageable towards aflatoxins, for example. The biological risk of path pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and parasites, it has to do with uh, product manipulation, product handling, adequate kill steps, good cleaning and sanitation practices, and good environmental monitoring. And then again, the risk of economically motivated adulteration that could impact food safety. Um, I, I read one, an, once an article, very interesting one from Brazil, that uh, Brazil has green beans that are very desired in the north of Brazil, they're very tasty uh, and, and more expensive. So somebody decided to, uh, use a green dye on white beans, which were a lot cheaper. And people started buying those green beans and the water was getting green, which wouldn't happen if they were really green, okay? But the problem is that dye was also, uh, could, could bring diarrhea in, in, in big quantities. So people started getting sick. So in this case, the motive was really economically motivated, but it impacted the health of the consumer, especially children, because children have less tolerance for that. So they, they're get, they get sicker, okay? And that is when you have to include that in your food safety plan. If there's a risk of economically motivated adulteration for those types of ingredients, because you can look at a history of happenings on that, you include that as part of your model and uh, you treat it as a risk for food fraud and how you're going to control it, okay? Cool. All right. So you've given us a lot to think about, Liliana. We'll take a little pause here and hear from our participants again. So we're gonna move into a little conversation about the components of a pizza. So we wanted to ask you, what do you think? Who's responsible for the food safety of the dough? Now we're talking not just you know the pizza in general, but specifically of that dough. So you should have a multiple choice question on the app. Again, it's menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And the code that you'd have to put in is at the top of my screen if you want to play along here. Most people said manufacturer and ingredient supplier for sure. Mm -hmm. A couple of people said distribution, retailer, and consumer. 
So do we want to talk about that a little bit, Liliana? So I agree. Yeah. I, if I were voting, I think I would have probably selected all yeah. of these mm -hmm. entities. It, it has to do with who's going to be ultimately responsible to handle food safety of that pizza dough. And if you are buying, if you are buying the pizza dough or the frozen pizza, you're going to be cooking it. Uh, so if you look at food safety and you look at biological risks, the consumer is responsible. The expectation is that the physical and chemical were handled at the manufacturer or uh, at the manufacturer level. And then there is responsibility in, in the retailer and the distribution in temperature handling for the retailer. Uh, in uh, in the distribution and in integrity and all the topics that we discussed, pest control, temperature management. So I agree. And the ingredient supplier has responsibility. The minimum responsibility is sourcing the ingredients compliant with the specifications that they offer and uh, the expectations of their uh, customers, okay? And we can talk a little bit about ingredients. Yeah. And the way I was thinking about it was that frozen pizza example. So maybe some folks were thinking more of the pizzeria. Um, they're going to be cooking that crust for you. Mm -hmm. so thanks for participating. We'll talk about it a bit more now. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, we're going to look a little bit and and uh, to see which, which transformational processes we have for each ingredient and all the ingredients that are involved in that process. So uh, if you look at the dough, it has flour, it has yeast, it has salt, it has water, and that's how we create the pizza dough. It is not ready to eat. Uh, so the expectation here is that you're not going to have a kill step, but you're still going to be managing the risks to make sure that you're not uh, carrying the risk of, of biological, physical, or chemical pathogens and sending that to your supplier. So, for example, for the flour, or e even though it's not going to be treated, you would not expect that if you identify the flour as contaminated with salmonella, you would still send it to your customer and say, oh, he's going to get rid of it, no problem. Okay, so at the end of the day, if it has salmonella, it would be adulterated in the in the FDA's eyes also. So you got to think about that model. There's still a requirement that there is some kind of control, even if it's not ready to eat. Okay, you can go to the next one. For the sake of time, I'm going to rush a little bit because we talked too much. <laughs> So the tomato sauce, as you can see, also a, a complex ingredient. There's a complex intermediate ingredient. Uh, it has several primary ingredients, uh, such as onion, tomatoes, cooking oil, and spices. Uh, that is considered a ready to eat. Uh, the way we look at it is it has been cooked. And so for biological risks, it is also ready to eat. The chemical and the physical are handled uh, either in the process or by the suppliers. And uh, so it carries the risk of its ingredients plus the ones of its process, okay? Next one. Uh, so here we have uh, the cheese and the cheese is, as, as you can see, extremely complex. Uh, it has a lot of ingredients uh, that, I mean, the main ingredient is milk. It has salt, it has an anti-caking agent. Uh, and then it has smaller ingredients like enzymes, like stratocultures, uh, like uh, natamycin. Yeah, did I say that right? Which is a mold inhibitor. And all those are going to uh, allow for the process of cheese to be made. Usually, pizza makers buy the cheese already made. So this is a model of a supply chain control that is going to be handled uh, at the supplier level and that the expectation is that all the, the, the physical, chemical, and biological hazards were handled at the supplier level because for a start, they're using pasteurized milk. They can have, uh, the yeast is going to be pasteurized as well. And the expectation is that it's going to be treated, okay? Anything to add, Mary, on that one? No, and we'll skip the little exercise just to make up some time. Yes. Uh, with the spice blend, uh, 
The herbs and spices are sourced all over the world and they may or may not be treated, okay? And, and spices is a category where there's a little bit of everything. Even if you look at Appendix 1, the guidance that Appendix 1 offers, uh, there's fumigation, there's irradiation, there's steam treatment. Uh, the steam treatment is, is, is a difficult one because it does modify color and flavor because there's a heat process. Uh, it includes drying, crushing, chopping, and blending. And you have to consider economically motivated adulterations on these, okay? So yeah, I think the example that we talk about, I think it was cumin, that there yeah. was economically motivated adulteration and they had used crushed peanut shells um, as a filler. So then um, that obviously represented a food safety risk with that undeclared allergen uh, having the peanut in there. Mm -hmm. In the majority of the cases, uh, in the case of the pizza, part of the spices are going to be cooked with the pizza, although some people can add spices and we use those every day. And uh, so the, the, the sourcing of the spices and the knowing the suppliers who are making those spices and understanding what kind of risks are the initial risks and how they're handling them is going to be very important to guarantee food safety, okay? So uh, when we talk about uh, tomatoes, uh, we're going to have tomatoes on the topic of our tomato and basil pizza. And here is where FDA identified that if you use sliced tomatoes, you need to have a preventive control, uh, which is uh, because it is a potentially hazard, hazardous food and you, have to, you need to have time temperature control to consider it a safe food. Uh, because of the high water activity and the pH. And when you slice it, you make available uh, the nutrients of, of the tomatoes. And I mean, the, the skin of the tomato protects the tomato from contamination with salmonella. But once you slice it, either through practices or through exposure, it can get contaminated with salmonella. So it requires a preventive control of time temperature. We can go to the next one. And uh, the basil follows the product safety rules. So uh, you have to understand the practices for harvest, post-harvest handling and sanitation. Look at a hygienic design zoning uh, to manage the practices and think of zone one as, as being surface clean and uh, pathogen free. Uh, inspection practices and follow GMP for employees and the big topic education and training okay to for everybody to understand with education why they're doing it agricultural water is also a big one think that surface water for anything any any uh, vegetable grown on the field is more likely to be contaminated with chemical materials so it is better to use groundwater or even uh public water if you can use for irrigation, okay? And do not irrigate close to the roots, irrigate around so to avoid or control contamination. Test for E. coli. Mm -hmm. So the supplier approval program, as you can see, covers everything that you can think of for a manufacturing facility from a hazard analysis, okay? Uh, to internal audits, history of recalls, verification of specification, environmental programs, GFSI, everything that you can think of, okay? Uh, look at the regulatory audits and GFSI to look at a history of failures and establish controls both for the approval and for the monitoring of suppliers that have at least a yearly revision and uh, understanding of modes of failure. So once you have an approved supplier, don't think that you need to look at them anymore. Keep on uh, creating channels to manage change with them and thinking that if they change specifications, you need to know it. If they had an incident, you, hit, you need to know it. If they had a recall, you need to know it. And uh, maintain the, 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 the Auditing process, review the third party audits to understand if the strength continues to be there. We can go to the next one. So when you monitor existing suppliers, you're gonna monitor performance. So you're gonna look at what well, we talked a little bit, okay? I talked about an annual review of their updates to the food safety systems, 
review the GFSIs and how the CAPAs were handled and closed. Uh, and what are the trends for leading and lagging indicators? Examples of those, for example, leading in one a leading indicator could be their environmental monitoring program or uh, the compliance with the master sanitation schedule. A lagging indicator uh, usually is consumer complaints. What complaints are they getting? Even if they don't have direct consumers, customer complaints in that case. What complaints are they getting from the customers? How are they handling packaging material as another uh, leading indicator? Then how they manage change. If there are incidents, what did they do? How do they manage non-conformance issues, even if they were not an incident or a near miss, okay? What was a recovery? How do they manage communications related to change? Does the workforce know that anything happened? And how do they modify their food safety systems to uh, make sure that it's capturing the need for change? And the partnerships and continuous improvement are very important. You share uh, synergies, you share practices that you do, you help them with education and training, you recommend incentives and recognition for the workforce so that there is really commitment from the workforce. And you try to have them have programs of capital investments for food safety risks. So if the walls are all cracked and the floors are all cracked, it is it is necessary to address it. So saying that I clean it thoroughly every day might not be enough, especially if, if on a GFSI you had failures for, that for the last three years. It seems that something better has to be done. Okay. And I think that partnership good. point is so important, especially now with the struggles people have been having in the supply chain. You know, it's really in everybody's best interest to work together with those suppliers and help bring them up to where you need them to be. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you're going to manage the supply chain, the food safety culture is, is really a great tool that we have. So uh, you make sure that the leaders at your supplier level establish a behavior-based culture and they lead by example, uh, that the workforce is empowered because then it becomes more committed, that they have a learning business where new skills are promoted and, and you can help them with all that. You can build all that together with them and build a partnership in all these bullet points that you welcome. they welcome change and you welcome change with them. Uh, establish internal and external communication. So communi you communicate with your suppliers, they communicate between the leaders and the workforce. Because then you're going to see that the internal trust is strong and then it strengthens the partnerships. Uh, cultures can be exported. So your supplier can export his culture to his suppliers and you can continue to export yours to them, okay? Other tools that we have for success are digital tools. Digital tools are more and more utilized, both for large businesses, medium businesses, and even smaller businesses. It, is, it helps you to know what is working for you and what is not, and what is working for your suppliers. You can look at trends very quickly. Uh, you can look at uh, failures. Uh, you can turn those into visual aids so that everybody gets involved and how things are going. And the more people have ownership and, and understand their role, feel more empowered, so you're more successful, okay? So let's talk about quality because we've been talking about food safety, but at the end of the day, the consumer, you all told me that uh, you loved your pizza, you like it, it had to be hot and, and you expect it to be delicious. So not only you have to deliver safe pizza, it's going to taste good, look good. If you have, uh, if you're promoting your pizza and you have photos of your pizza, make sure that your pizza looks like those photos. Consumers get very disappointed if you show them something that they're not going to get. Uh, that that is really a showstopper, and uh, that that you can guarantee that if they go back to buy it every day, the pizza is gonna give them that taste every day that they can remember. You have to meet with regulatory requirements for weight, for uh, size. If you're selling uh, 10 little mini pizzas in a bag and you're telling them it's 10, they gotta be 10. And you gotta establish a communication with the consumer. So make sure that if the consumer has a problem, you are providing a communication, a call-in number, 
somebody that's going to talk to them and somebody that's going to offer them comfort that they take them seriously and they're going to work with them, okay? So uh, every step of the supply chain impacts the consumer. We talked about all of them, and I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but uh, you have to keep in mind always that it is designed to ensure food security and food safety for the consumers at every step. As we talked before, the consumer expects that. It is the responsibility of each member of the supply chain to guarantee that, and that's why you have a systematic approach and everyone is obligated to guarantee that. So the last one is some best practices. Dedicate, when you see a risk, if you can dedicate, you dedicate. If you are a, a pizza shop, dedicate cutting boards for raw foods, for example, knives, okay? If you are a line, and you have a risk, if you can dedicate that line, it's better. If you cannot dedicate and you can separate, that's great. So you know the risk and you look at what you can do. You cannot dedicate, then I try to separate it. I don't want to cross-contaminate with allergens, so I try to put some kind of division between the, the line that contains allergens and the line that doesn't. You can segregate. Whatever, whatever is contaminated, you segregate it, whatever could be uh, non-compliant with what the consumer expects, you segregate it. You have to educate your workforce and, and always remember to educate because you're explaining why. Very important to say what you will do and then do it. Have good records that prove that you're doing it. If it's, it is not written, it never happened. So make sure that you carry records. And then a big one, if you see something, say something. So if you see that something is not done right, don't be afraid to say it. Be a team player and say it because that is improvement. And with that, I want to thank you and I want to apologize for going a little bit late. Uh, we really appreciate that uh, you were able to participate and I'm sorry we cannot take questions, but you can send them to us. You have our emails uh, and we'll be happy to respond to those. We could talk about this all day, couldn't we, Liliana? Yes, all day. Pizza <laughs> I and food safety. Yes, and so now I want pizza. <laughs> so I want to thank Liliana and Mary for all their education on this subject that we all deal with every day. And let you all know that there, this session has been recorded, as you saw, so we will be sending it out with a follow-up email. We also will address questions that um, were asked. We can address those right in the email so that you can see what um, the answers would be from the experts here. So thank you again for your participation. And this now ends the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.